Today, I want to talk about the program that partly funds this uh, lecture series too, the EPSCO program, <coughs> and what it is. Uh, this program, Experimental Program for Stimulating Competitive Research, it's a large statewide program. And the work I'm presenting today is a cumulative work from a large team of researchers. Uh, in the hall, I see several of them over here. Uh, just by show of hands, people who are associated with the EPSCO program and research students, staff, faculty, could you please raise your hand here and make yourself known? Oh. That's good, that's good. Can you stand up also, please? Yeah, that would be great. Well, I don't see people standing up from EPSCOR. EPSCOR people, if you would just stand up, that, that's great. Thank you so much. The reason why I asked them to stand up is because there'll be many questions, and uh, you know how to direct and deviate the questions, too, and I will also know that. So uh, what this program is doing is looking at what's changing in Alaska and how people around are adapting to the, those changes. Well, we are um, in the fifth year of a four-year, five-year program. This program, the EPSCO program, the National Science Foundation funds this, and National Science Foundation realizes that funding is not equitable across the United States. States that get less than 0.75% of the research funding from the National Science Foundation over a three-year period they are eligible to be EPSCO states. So there are several states and territories across, shown in red on this map, that are designated, that, that are eligible for EPSCO funding. Alaska started receiving this funding in 2001, and since then we've been working to increase our research capacity within the state. We do that in several ways, by hiring faculty, by supporting students, reaching out to the communities, and engaging in a variety of research, both physical sciences, biological sciences, social sciences, and interdisciplinary research. Did I hear a wow? That's cool, yeah. So in this particular project, the room temperature is the same, but it's just you feel cold, you feel warm, you feel happy, these are all our perceptions. That's how our brain functions, how it perceives information. Uh, that's our perception. But if I were to put an instrument, I would put a thermometer here and measure the temperature. That would be an instrument, right? So that's the difference between perception and instrument. In Alaska, when we go through this whole summer month, and then the temperature, it's a beautiful summer out here, temperatures start dropping. It's 30 degree Fahrenheit. What we do, we just bundle up. Yeah? And that's our perception. A body tells us it's cold, you bundle up. But then if it's like this year or any other year where the temperatures go down to minus 40, minus 50, you've lived through this long spell of cold winters, suddenly it starts warming up in the spring, the temperatures rise, it's 30 degree Fahrenheit, <laughs> That's what it feels like. <laughs> now, I look outside and look at my sensor, the thermometer. It's still showing 30 degrees Fahrenheit. But our perception of that environment is very different. So our perception and what the instruments are saying sometimes are in sync, and sometimes they're out of sync. You do this too often, what's going to happen? You put yourself at risk, right? you're likely to get a frostbite. So again, the, the philosophy here is that when your perception and what the instruments are saying are not in sync, then you are at risk. Now this is about one single person that we're talking about. What we do in our program is we've taken it to a whole different level. We've expanded this to a large scale to look at communities, not just one person. So what are com our communities perceiving about their landscape? What's happening there? We go and measure them too, and then uh, we, we see whether it matches or not. And this is what we called P delta I. P is our perception, and I is the instrumentation. If the change, if the, if the difference between perception and instrument is huge, this delta is large, and again, we're not making the best decisions. 
But if it's cold, we sense it right, we, everything's saying that, this, this perception in instrument is close, this delta is small, and we, we're making you know, decisions that are in sync with what we should. So again, let's talk, we'll, we'll, I'll walk you through this. Again, I should not breathe. I'll walk you through this uh, and how we're looking at it in our large project out here. So just looking through those questions, what we did was, uh, this is a statewide project and we structured it around three test cases, widely distributed around the state. Our state is huge. The changes around the stage are huge. You know, you go to the North Slope, it's a different type of change than what you see in the South East. So we took that as an opportunity to learn uh, from, from the diversity around here and then just get to some of these uh, landscape changes and communities in different areas. And then we also have a statewide team that actually looks at everything from all, all the test cases and has some integrated findings. We have people from our education outreach group over here that work with all communities across the state, taking the message, the lessons we've learned out to the communities, to the children, to the elders. And so I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is, there are in this uh, project about 100 researchers working, about 500 students that we, we reach out to in general. So it's, it's a large project, it's very difficult to tell you everything. So what I'm gonna do is pick up some examples, one example each from each of the test case today. First from the northern test case, uh, are, which is centered on the Nuiqsad, the community village of Nuiqsad. It's a small village of about 400 residents. Uh, they're a bush community there. They're, they live in this uh, mixed cash and subsistence economy. It's all driven by oil development over there. They are right at the center of it. And that is one of our study sites. Our leader from the northern test ca case, Gary Kofinas, is also here in the audience, and I encourage you to talk to him later, a lot more uh, detail about this case study. But over here, what I want to present is the work of one of our new hires, faculty hires, Todd Brinkman. Uh, he works with our student, Taylor Stinchcomb, who's also, Taylor, where are you? I saw you in the audience there, right at the back is Taylor, and I'm presenting a part of her work. And what Todd and Taylor did, it often happens, you know, I, I don't know how many times you've heard this, is the scientists think that we know what the community wants. And they do their research, and sometimes then they'll go say, here's my result. You see, it might be helpful for you, you take it. But in EBSCO, we've taken a different approach over here. What we say is, we don't know what the community needs. At first, let's assess what the community wants, and then let's design our research after that. So that's what we've done. And uh, this example is one of those where Todd gave out 14 hunters GPS units with cameras and said, go out and take pictures of what you're observing and in your, what, what's changing in the environment, what you find interesting, take pictures of that. And these are pictures taken from those GPS units and then they were given fact sheets to write about what they're perceiving, what they see. And, and there were pictures of changes occurring over there, erosions happening in the landscape, permafrost thawing, developmental activities going on. And then after looking at those fact sheets, talking to the, to the community, what the community also expressed was that there are changes that are happening, but one thing that is happening in the North Slope much more is that people are hearing, seeing a lot more air traffic. And this is something w that wasn't in our research agenda. And says, we've got a lot more, and we are concerned that this air traffic is affecting the caribou population, for example, over there, and just the animals that we hunt. And so Taylor and Todd worked together and said, okay, if that is the concern, let's see what we can do. And so the research was designed after understanding the community concern. Yes, Taylor, and she, they went ahead and this is the Colville River, Nuiqsat is the community here, and they put these sound sensors, very simple sensors that community members can deploy and they can record the data. And they put it around 20 different sites to just see what is the air traffic like. This is really cool. When Taylor showed us this, she was just so excited. Uh, we thought we should be able to pick up the sound every time the aircraft goes. 
these graphs over here, over here it shows the time, and here it shows the frequency of the sound. And so you see that every time an aircraft goes, the noise level goes up. But more interesting than just the noise level go up, going up where they could count the number of aircrafts going over, every different type of aircraft made a different pattern of noise. And you could see that the uh, single prop uh, and, uh, and helicopters had these really loud noises, much louder than the other jet planes that were smooth. So they plot, this, this is really interesting, and, and they did this for a 90-day period in 2016. <coughs> and plotted those results. And these are preliminary results. Taylor is still working on these. And saw that most of, not only there was a heavy traffic, th these are the stations around the Nuiqsat area I showed in the map. There was a lot of uh, fixed wing aircrafts, propeller planes going. And most of the noise was around this community, which is also understandable. But what they are doing now, as I said, these are preliminary results. They are finding out where are the hot spots of the noise and then uh, combining them where, with where the caribou population is going and where, where uh, the movement of the animals, and they will be presenting their results and compiling their results soon. But it's, it's pretty intriguing is that how these community-based observations can be carried forward. It's a simple tool, very affordable, and uh, really gives something that we showed. And then what our outreach team does is that they worked with the trapper school children and then gave them actually the photographs taken by the hunters over there. These are all photographs taken by the hunters. One of the hunters took this photograph showing that the lake over there has drained into the Colville River. It's, it's dried out, it's drained in here. And the children over there, these are middle school children, high school children, they plotted this on story maps. So you've got satellite images like you have on Google Earth where they tag these photographs and you can see it's this lake that actually eroded and opened up and went into the river. So then you have a whole story of a bigger picture of what uh, is happening in the area. And it's also a really intriguing way of engaging the children uh, with, with real data that, that their community has taken. So that was about the northern test case. And I am going to take you to another tour around another part of the state, going to the Kenai River watershed in the south central test case. This case, uh, this test uh, case uh, is focused on fishery studies because that is the important commodity in this area. And uh, we have a large team of researchers working out there also. What they are trying to do is look at future possible scenarios. What is going to happen? What are the plausible things that could happen? What's changing? And what's driving the changes in South Central uh, Alaska? The uh, stakeholders here were the fishers, uh, the fisheries managers, the fisher guides, community members, sport fishers, uh, commercial fisheries uh, folks. And so we, uh, the, the team got all of these stakeholders in a room and held a workshop. And they, it was facilitated by an artist also who graphically designed, uh, you know, captured what, what the discussions were going on. They were given um, the task of identifying six criteria that they think that, that were important. What is changing? Any guesses what's ha changing in the South Central test in, in, in Alaska in those areas? When we saw the responses, the overwhelming response was one of the drivers of change was climate change. And so there is climate change, there's economic development, many drivers that were identified, but climate, driver, climate change was one of, the, one of the prime drivers. And then not only are these, what are these drivers of change, but what can you do? What, what are your alternatives? And if a decision has to be made, who are the people who are going to make the decision? So those were the factors that uh, were built into the scenario planning. Goodness, this is sparking. It's good. Uh, our researchers also had been collecting data basically on fish abundance, because fish is so important over there and also an environment, uh, uh, what's, what's changing over there. And these data sets are also help uh, in, these dis uh, in these discussions. And finally, in a second workshop, uh, with these different six criteria that were discussed, they came up with five different uh, 
scenarios that could be that would be possible for the Kenai watershed. Now, I got a lot more information about these scenarios for those people who are interested. It's also on our website because each one will take a long time. But one of the scenarios is that climate warming is happening. It's going to warm up the temperatures. The rivers will also be warmer temperatures. Fishing, it's good for the fish. You can fish in the evening too. Um, reasonable economic boom, but not too much. It looks like a wonderful place for retirees to go. And so there's infrastructure development, and it becomes what we call a retirement paradise. That's just one scenario. Another scenario is there's interest in oil and gas in this area. There's a development of a plant. And uh, climate warming is also going on, but then there's water depletion, uh, less sport fishing, but in general, more economic boon. So there are different kinds of scenarios. So what happens is that if you make these scenarios and you present these scenarios to the decision makers, it evokes a different kind of discussion. Because you're not just waving your hand. You're ac actually showing that these are possible scenarios. What would you do in these different situations? So really cool exercise. But to explain this, the artist over there um, sketches this out. And also, they made two minute videos because people's attention span to listen. Like you all are a real cool audience, but not always is that the case, right? So, for two minutes video clippings, we put them up there. It's on our website. Each scenario is very well explained in those videos. Going uh, down to the Southeast test case study, it's a completely different study. It's near Juno. And Juno is one of those urban areas attracts millions of visitors a year. So many people coming up over there to visit the Juneau area, the southeast Alaska area, and look at the glaciers out there that are also receding due to climate warming. So the study site was near Berners Bay. And I am highlighting the work of one of our economists, uh, Brian van der Nald. I hadn't worked with an economist before. This is fascinating. Economists like to, like to attribute dollar values to everything. How do you attribute dollar values to things like walking in the woods, fresh air, fresh water? How would you assign a dollar value? What's the, what's the value of that? Now, that's an interesting question. My mind can't figure that out, but Brian is really smart, and he figures that out. And he did what we call a choice experiment. And it's, it assigns a non-market value to a landscape or the service that a landscape provides. So he instituted this survey with his students um, to all the tourists who were coming on the ships over there and uh, you know, were taking these helicopter rides to see the Mendenhall Glacier. And he said, using our science data, he projected three scenarios. He says, this glacier is receding. That's a fact. This glacier is receding. This is the beautiful Mendenhall Glacier over here. But he says, if you don't do anything from the visitor center where you're sitting, today you see this glacier. But in 60 years time, that's what you'll see. What's causing the glacier recession? The climate's warming. Right, the glacier is receding, but it's warming also because there's fossil fuel. But if you could abate some of the fossil fuel effects, and maybe you could put, how can you stop a glacier from melting? Cool down the climate. Don't use so much fossil fuel. You could do that, or you could do what the Europeans do in the ski resorts. They uh, snow. Yeah. They, they, they make snow, you could do that too. We did not give that choice. Brian should have consulted you. But what he did was he, he gave the choice that you put a, what they call an ice blanket. It's this reflective blanket that you put over the glacier. It reflects all the lights, so the glacier doesn't warm up and it doesn't melt. So he says, you know, you could do that and you could, you could save the glacier from receding. And you could do a modest kind of a thing or you could do an aggressive abatement and then this is what the glacier would look like in 60 years. So your grandchildren could see that. And he asked those questions and then uh, got those responses from them and run, ran that through a very rigorous statistical model. To see the dollar value assigned. 
Of course, if you don't do anything, you don't have to pay anything. It's zero value, zero cost to you. But it was interesting to see that through the survey, what we found was that participants were ready to pay anywhere from 250 to over $1,000 over a year to really keep the nature intact because it was so valuable to them. And for an aggressive uh, abatement scenario, even up to $1,500. Now, mind you, it's not like you're going to pay $100 and you get a chunk of ice out here. It's not like that. Uh, and there is a bias in this kind of a judgment, too, because people who are coming there on the boat, which phase in life are they? They're happy people, right? They're probably rich people, or they've saved all their life, and they've had this aha moment. They're not all local residents. So there is that bias in the data set, but it is really still interesting to see how you can actually assign a value to see what these ecosystem services provide. And so what the researchers over there do, they, after doing these kind of analysis, they talk to the um, tour operators, both the helipad operators and the marine tour operators, those who run whale watching uh, tours. And they talk about climate change. They talk about its impact. They talk about the economic value of our landscape. And there's a healthy discussion over there, and this is what our project does. And once you talk to them, these operators then reach out to millions of people who come for summer tourism uh, in, in this area. So again, these are three examples from three completely different areas, which is also talking about what people are perceiving, what our instruments are measuring, what value our landscape uh, we've assigned to the landscape over here, and really, uh, what pr we, we, our researchers generate many of these products that we take to our stakeholders and to the communities. All the products that we generate, we make it a point that they are openly accessible to the public through our websites. Um, we've invested in a lot of old images and new images from satellites, from aircraft, so that you can see in your hometown what happened in Alaska and different parts of Alaska? What happened in 19? What was the landscape like in 1950, 1970, 1980? And decade over decade, you can map those changes. So those are the kind of things. But also just to teach about the landscape. If I don't know if uh, some of you have seen this. If not, we have this augmented reality sandbox where children can play in the sand and make little mountains and rivers over there in real time. And it portrays this. It's, it's also there uh, at the Children's <coughs> Museum downtown. If you haven't, I encourage you to come and see that. And then all these scientific results, the indices that we were talking about, those are the kind of products that we like to get to the, uh, to the decision makers and to the community members. So I'm going to show you a couple of, not all of these, but a few of these products, the P delta I index, of what our findings were in this area. Because it's important, if, if they perceive it well, it, it, it talks a little bit about their adaptive capacity or, or their capacity to adapt. So the, taking a breather here, this turning back to the northern test case. Um, Gary and his students uh, went up to the Nuiqsut community and, and uh, talked to the residents over there and ask them about their perceptions of what is happening to the weather over there, what's happening to the temperatures, the winter temperatures, and summer temperatures. Do you see whether they're getting warmer or cooler? And here is the result of the perception of change for, for, from the people in New Exet. And most of, the, most of them said, yes, our winter temperatures, <coughs> yes, green is winter and summer is in blue. And so they say, most of them really detected that both summer and winter temperatures are warming. Let's see what the instruments say. These are the data sets from 1960 in blue 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000. This is the winter temperature. And you see a marked increase in the winter temperature in this area. This is, let me tell you, this is not just for the Nuiqsut community, but it's true for all Alaska North Slope, this trend. And you see also in summer temperatures, there is an increase, but not as drastic as in winter temperatures. And people's perception that that's, that's more common in winter is also quite aligned with what the instruments are saying. So really, if you go and look, work with these communities, you realize that the community members are really in sync. They know very well what's happening in their environment. 
they, they perceive the environmental changes really well. Here's another P delta I, difference between perception and instrumented data. And this time, I'm showing you a graph from the south central test case. Here in, on this axis is data from 1985 till 2015. And this graph shows the salmon abundance. So what's happening? I mean, you see these ups and downs. But if you look at the trend, this is showing the count, the fish count you see that there has been a steady decrease in the fish count, in the salmon count, in this area. It's, again, this is for the Kenai watershed, again, from 85 to 2015. One of the questions that was asked in those workshops to the community members and also just uh, through a mail-in survey were, what is your perception of what's happening to the fish out there? I want to show you this graph, which I find really interesting. Most people, like this is for the fish, in green are the fish, gui fish guides, and this is the fisheries managers. And both of them perceived really well that, yes, there is a decrease. Both of them had that good perception, though the perception of the fisher guides was much more unanimous than those of the managers. So again, both recognized that there is a decrease in the fisheries, but perceptions by groups comes out to be a little different. So again, taking this back, one step back, and saying, so what? What have we learned out there? Um, what have we learned about uh, the environment, the changes, and the adaptation, and, and how people are adapting to this? One thing we saw across the state, regardless of where we were working in the state, that the landscape is changing dramatically. Hydrology, particularly, is changing. By hydrology, I mean like the surface water. In the north slope, you see lakes draining into the rivers. In the southeast, you see glaciers that are also water bodies, really, melting and receding. In south central, you see the rivers changing its courses and, and its forms. So there is a dramatic change in the hydrology all across the state. And that is important, because where do people live? They live close to water. Water is a commodity. Animals live close to, the, close to the water. That's where they get their water, and that's where people live. So the whole ecosystem is changing, but also the services we get from the ecosystem, that is changing. So what I mean by ecosystem services is that if the water is changing in South Central, then the fish that live in the water is also changing. Their abundance is going down. That's a service. That's a commodity for that community. So the community definitely is getting affected by this. And this we saw across the state. That was just one broader take home message. The other thing uh, we saw, and, and I've mentioned this before in the presentation too, that there was great wealth in the local community, great knowledge wealth in the local community. They were quite in tune with what the environment is doing. And I'm not sure if this is just for Alaska or everywhere else in the world, but Alaskan communities are definitely in sync with their environment. They know what they, they have a very good perception of what is going on. And uh, generally, the correlation between the perception and what we are measuring with our instruments was, was very close. So that's a really great thing that's, that says a lot about our communities here. The other thing we saw was that the, I've been talking about the speed delta i, the uh, perception, the difference in perception and instrumented uh, values. Uh, the closer they were to the resource, the local uh, people who were living on the lands and using the lands, their perceptions were much closer and, and uh, were much more in tune. So there is, uh, this, is a, this is a quote from Gary over here sitting in the audience. Says, uh, the local knowledge of change provides rich insight, and that's grounded by the people's experience in the land and traveling through, they're harvesting their, 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 they're engaged in subsistence hunting, they know the land, they know their environment. And that definitely brings that delta down. And that's an important take back because when we are making decisions, uh, both things become important. When you're making a decision, perceptions are also important. And what your data is saying, scientific data, both have a role to play. And you can make richer and better decisions 
if you were accounting for both of those things. And that was really one of our other take home messages that value both work that we do together, both community members and researchers when they work together, there is a greater richness in, in, in that because we are uh, together learning much more about and we have uh, together a much better idea about what's happening and what are the needs and what decisions should be made. So that's, that's a really, so how do we how do, we do that? Um, we've, we've got this wealth of scientific data, now we have good partnership with the stakeholders, but how do we take this to the next step forward? And that'll take me uh, to one of the last slides that I wanna um, talk about. Where we invested in our project was in a facility in, in the University of Alaska Anchorage. It's the, we, we've invested in the planetarium and visualization theater, which is really a domal space that d displays data. And we display our models and our data sets out there uh, for people, the scenarios that I've been talking about. So they've got this beautiful display of the model scenarios up in the uh, visualization theater. Uh, in uh, the Fairbanks campus here at the university, we've uh, invested in what we call the Decision Theater North. It's a small uh, room, but it's got these seven display monitors, 4K monitors. It's a beautiful facility. I encourage you all, if you all want to see, to just contact our group, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'd be happy to show this facility to you. But it's an interactive space where researchers and community members and decision makers can come and, and in real time, or, or even whether it's, so you can display these uh, scenarios on the, on the big monitors, <coughs> and that sparks, and you can see the changes in the scenario and their impact, and that triggers the discussion on what should be done, what, what measures should be taken. And so that's a space that, uh, this is the most recent facility that we've developed and uh, started using it with the Fairbanks North Star Borough, with the Emergency Management Services, with Fish and Wildlife Service, with BLM, many stakeholder holder agencies that we've worked with here. And uh, next, I think, Gary, you're bringing the Nuiqsut community up here to show these results and work with them. So that's, that's next uh, up with the EBSCO program. So again, uh, a lot over there that I covered, but again, I want to emphasize that much of this work is done by a large team of researchers, not just uh, one research project, but it's, it's, it's an amalgamation in, of findings of many researchers, many places in, in the state, but, and I want to acknowledge all of them who've contributed to this project. I know that our uh, Northern Test Case and the South Central Test Case, some of the researchers are here, Southeast researchers are not here, but five years of this project uh, winding up now, and we are in the process of writing for another five-year grant that would uh, expand some of the work established here, especially the interdisciplinary research, getting physical scientists, social scientists, and biologists all together, working on larger concepts of what's changing and uh, how we're adapting to those changes. And so I really am very thankful to the National Science Foundation and the state of Alaska that funds this program. And thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>